very uh, real sincere pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Wade Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis is an explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society, but uh, that doesn't do justice to really what he's done. Besides being an anthropologist, he's been an author of over 17 books. He's uh, produced over 20 films. Uh, some of his more recent publications you may be aware of, like um, uh, Sacred uh, Waters, uh, the more recent one, Into the Silence, was a number one bestseller in Canada. It's now being made into a film. And his most recent one this year, River Notes, about the death and revival of the Colorado River. You've probably all been asked this question about who you'd like to be, uh, if you could be somebody else. I think I've decided mine's going to be Wade Davis. <laughs> Extremely envious, you're going to see, I saw a few slides last night. He's uh, been all over the world and uh, uh, been able to deal with many, many different types of relationships. And I said earlier this morning, he's going to give us that big picture and some really good ideas to think about as we get on with our daily activities. So please join with me in welcoming Dr. Davis. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the Fort Nelson First Nations, the elders, um, Chief Charlene, Kathy, um, and uh, especially um, Jas uh, Jasmine, who really is the one who is responsible for me being here. Oh, sorry, let's see if we can get this up a little closer. Is that a little bit, is that better? You got, got some volume there? Anyway, I'd like to thank all the elders uh, for the Fort Nelson First Nation um, and all the wonderful people who have um, joined with us here today. Um, you know, when Jasmine came up to our lodge in Taltan country at the edge of the sacred headwaters, uh, we spoke about the truth and reconciliation work that she had been done. And by chance, I had just heard Justice Sinclair speak in, to the Assembly of First Nations in Ottawa and I, I was very taken by something Justice Sinclair said when he remarked that there were only three questions in life. Who am I, where do I come from, and where am I going? And he remarked that the crisis that occurred at the time of European contact in the Americas with the Amerindian civilizations was intense not simply because the weight of military um, power, the terrible impact of diseases, but because the dominant invading power essentially said to all societies that the answers they had had for those questions for all of their history had been wrong. And this, of course, is what gave birth to the residential schools. But also you ask yourself, how could people have so casually accepted that kind of edict on their lives? Well, the answer was because the European powers, by a kind of accident of history and biology, indeed did have power on their sides. You know, the word decimate comes from the Latin to destroy one in ten. The Aboriginal peoples of the Americas, the peoples of Polynesia, were not decimated by the arrival of European diseases. Ninety percent of the individuals were swept away by smallpox and measles. And the military power was not trivial either. The technological advantages was distilled in that famous ditty of the 19th century, uh, where the uh, Hillock Belloc said, of the people met on the colonial frontier, whatever they have got, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. Well, of course, the Maxim gun was the first effective machine gun, and to give you a sense of its dominance in battle, at the Battle of Omdurman in 1898, the British faced down the Sudanese rebels, and they killed 11,000 individuals and wounded 14,000 against a loss on their side of a mere 48. And then in the wake of the arrival of the Europeans came the missionaries walking across the beaches of Polynesia or through the forests of North America. And of course, the missionaries came from one of the two religious ideologies of the world that presumes to have the monopoly on the route to the divine, Christianity and Islam. And that created a psychological burden that still hangs like a hangover 
over indigenous people throughout the Americas. In the Amazon, I live with the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, who were severely impacted by the um, missionary presence in the 1970s, and now they've um, asked the missionaries to leave and their culture is rebounded by them. But I asked an elder once, how was it that they had permitted missionaries in their lives? And he said to me, because they told us they could make us human. And in the wake of this history, it's perhaps possible to feel that the way you think about water, and we use language like sacred, that somehow you're an anachronism, or somehow you're a minority, and this dominant industrial worldview, that, which has placed an industrial carpet of, over this entire country in but two generations, is somehow the real world, and how those people think is a real wave of history. And what I'm here really to suggest this morning that when viewed through the anthropological lens, the truth is rather the opposite. And this industrial idea that Dian animates the world and is prepared to do anything to the natural ecosystems that will generate economic return, irrespective of the ecological consequences, is by far and away the exception to the way most peoples of the world view their relationship with their environments. And so let's step back for a moment and really look at this in a broad picture. I'm going to take you literally all around the world this morning. One of the intense pleasures of, of travel, and certainly work as an anthropology, as an anthropologist, is indeed the opportunity to live amongst those who have not forgotten the old ways, who still feel their past in the wind, touch it in stones polished by rain, taste it in the bitter leaves of plants. And just to know that in the Amazon, jaguar shaman still journey beyond the Milky Way, or that in the high Arctic, the myths of the Inuit elders still resonate with meaning, or that in the Himalaya, the Buddhists still pursue the breath of the Dharma, is to remember the central revelation of anthropology, and that is the idea that the world into which you were born does not exist in some absolute sense, but it's just one model of reality, the consequence of one particular set of adaptive choices that your lineage made, however successfully, many generations ago. But whether it is a voodoo acolyte in Haiti, a yak herder on the slopes of Shomolungma, Mount Everest, an eagle hunter of Kazakhstan, or a thunderhoof shaman of Mongolia, all of these peoples teach us that there are other ways of being other ways of thinking, other ways of orienting yourself in social, spiritual, and ecological space. And that's an idea that, if you think about it, can only fill you with hope. Now, together, the myriad of cultures of the world make up a social and spiritual web of life that envelops the planet and is as important to the well-being of the planet as is the biological web of life that you know as a biosphere. And you could define the cultural web of life as being an ethnosphere. And you could describe the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all thoughts and dreams, ideas and intuitions, myths and hopes and promises brought into being by the human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's fantastic collective legacy. It's a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as a wildly creative species. And just as the biosphere is being severely eroded with the loss of habitat and the loss of plants and animal life, so too is the ethnosphere, but if anything at a far greater rate. No biologist would dare suggest that 50% of plants and animals are on the road to extinction, because it simply is not true. And yet that, the most apocalyptic scenario in the realm of biological diversity, scarcely approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of cultural diversity. And the great indicator of this, of course, is language loss. When each of you in this room were born, there were 7,000 languages spoken on Earth. Now, a language isn't just a body of grammar or a body of vocabulary. A language is a flash of the human spirit. It's a vehicle through which the soul of each particular culture comes into the material world. Every language is an old growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of social and spiritual possibilities. And of those 7,000 languages spoken the day that you were born, 
over half are not being taught to infants. They're not being taught to children, which means effectively they're on the road to extinction. Now, there are many people, particularly in the dominant society, who say, well, wait a minute, wouldn't the world be a better place if we all spoke one language? Wouldn't communication be facilitated? Wouldn't it be easier for us to get along? And my answer to that is always say, what a great idea. But let's make that universal language Nuptatuk. Let's make it Dene. Let's make it Haida. Let's make it Lakota. And suddenly you begin to feel, of, as a native speaker of English, what it would be like to be enveloped in silence, to have no means or ability to pass on the wisdom of your ancestry or to anticipate the promise of your descendants. But that dreadful plight is indeed the fate of somebody on earth every two weeks, because on average every fortnight some elder passes away and carries with them into the grave the last syllables of an ancient tongue. Now the reason this is so tragic is because it's happening at a time when science for the first time in this miraculous way has proven something to be, true, to be true that philosophers have always dreamed to be true and that is that we're all brothers and sisters and I don't mean that in the spirit of hippie ethnography. I mean quite literally we are cut from the same genetic cloth. Studies of the human genome have left no doubt whatsoever that the genetic endowment of humanity is a single continuum. Race is an utter fiction. In fact, all of us are descendants of a handful of people who walked out of Africa some 60,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary journey that lasted 2,500 generations, a year of 40,000 years in the making, that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. But here's the important revelation. If you accept that we're all cut from the same genetic cloth, every culture by definition shares the same raw human genius. And how this genius is expressed is simply a matter of choice and adaptive insights. There is no progression in the affairs of culture. That old Victorian idea that there was a ladder to success that invariably placed Victorian England at the apex of a pyramid that sloped down to the so-called primitives of the world has absolutely been ridiculed by modern science and shown to be as much an artifact of the 19th century as the notion that clergymen had in that time that the earth was only 6,000 years old. In an astonishing way, science has shown the interconnectedness of ourselves. And so what that means is whether a society indulges technological wizardry, which has been the great achievement of the West, or by contrast, invests human genius in the task of unraveling the complex threads of memory inherent in a myth, is simply a matter of choice. And what this means is that the other cultures of the world are not failed attempts at being modern. They're certainly not failed attempts at being English. Each is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the 7,000 cultures of the world answer that question, they do so in 7,000 voices, different voices, which collectively become our human repertoire for dealing with the, all the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming centuries. The challenge, though, is what do we do about it? When I was recruited to the National Geographic as part of our conservation mission, I was told that over a decade, I was to change the way the world viewed and valued culture. Well, it was a challenge because, of course, change is the one constant in culture. You know, you know, when to expect someone from the Dene or the Cree to look, act, dress like their grandparents is abs as absurd as to ask me to dress, look, and act like my grandfather. Change is the one constant. All peoples are dancing with new possibilities for life. Technology is no threat to culture. The Lakota did not stop being Lakota when they gave up the bow and arrow for the rifle any more than an American gave up uh, stopping an American when they gave up the horse and buggy for the automobile. The question is, you can't freeze people in time like some kind of biological specimen. You can't create a rainforest park of the mind. So when we set out to address this issue of culture, we decided the only thing we could do was, as storytellers, to bring our audience of 160 million people a week in the points of the ethnosphere where the traditional beliefs were so dazzling that you couldn't help but come away having embraced this sort of new revelation about the nature, importance, and contribution of all cultures. The notion that every single culture has something to say to the world, that every culture deserves a place at the council of human knowledge and wisdom. So for example, I made a film called The Buddhist Science of the Mind. Now why would you use the word science for what you think of as a religion? 
Well, what of course is science but the empirical pursuit of the truth? What is Tibetan Buddhism but 2,500 years of direct empirical observation as to the nature of mind? A Tibetan Lama once said to me, Western science is too often a major response to minor needs. You spend all of your lifetimes trying to live to be 100 without losing your teeth. We spend all of our lives trying to understand the nature of being alive. He said, your billboards in the West celebrate naked teenagers in underwear. Our billboards are prayers for the well-being of all sentient creatures. But what do I mean by different cultures using this human genius to manifest in ways that are beyond anything you could dream of? Well, let's go for a moment to the greatest culture sphere ever brought into being by the human imagination, that of Polynesia, an eighth of the surface of the planet, tens of thousands of islands flung like jewels upon the southern sea. Recently, I was invited to sail on the Hokalea, the recreated sacred canoe of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. These are sailors who, in the memory of their ancestors, sail on this vessel named after the sacred star of Hawaii, Hokalea, and the vessel has become the symbol of the resurgence of those cultures. And these are sailors who even today can name 250 stars in the night sky. These are sailors who can sense and identify the presence of distant atolls of islands beyond the visible horizon simply by watching carefully the reverberation of waves across the hull of their vessel, knowing well that every island group in the Pacific has its own unique pattern that can be read with the same ease with which a forensic scientist would read a fingerprint. These are sailors who, in the darkness of the hull, can identify five or six different sea swells moving through the vessel at any one point in time, distinguishing those caused by local weather disturbances from the deep currents that pulsate across the ocean and can be followed with the same ease with which a terrestrial traveler would follow a river to the sea. Indeed, if you took all of the genius that allowed us to put a man on the moon and applied it to the ocean, what you would get is Polynesia. But the most amazing thing about it is that the entire system of navigation was based on dead reckoning. That means that you only know where you are by remembering how you got there. Now, it was the impossibility of using dead reckoning on an oceanic voyage that kept Europeans hugging the shores of continents until the British solved the problem of longitude in the 18th century. But we know for a scientific fact that 10 centuries before Christ, the ancestors of the Polynesians set sail into the rising sun. And they were a tradition that lacked the written word. And what that meant was the wayfinder, sitting monk-like on the back of the vessel, over the course of a multi-week journey, had to remember every shift of wind, every shift of current, every sign of the sea, and every shift in speed of the vessel. And that, of course, was Polynesia. But let's go now into the greatest forest in the world, the Amazon, a forest the size of the face of the full moon. And we come into the homeland of the people of the Anaconda, the Barasana, the Makuna, the Tanimukos, people who believe that they originated in the belly of the sacred serpent at the edge of the Milk River that carried them up the Amazon, where they were regurgitated on the various banks of the Northwest Amazon, a people who live so closely to the forest that cognitively they do not distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the forest is equated to the canopy of the heavens. Or if we go down to the homeland of the, of the Warani, a remarkable people that were first peacefully contacted in 1958, fully five years after I was born. In 1957, five missionaries attempted contact and made a critical mistake. They dropped from the air eight by 10 glossy photographs of themselves in what we would say to be friendly gestures, forgetting that the people of the forest had never seen anything two dimensional in their lives. So they picked up the photographs, looked behind the photograph to try to find the form to the figure, saw nothing, and concluded that these were calling cards from the devil, and they promptly speared the five missionaries to death. But the Warani had a knowledge of their forest that was simply extraordinary. Their hunters could smell animal urine at 60 paces and tell you what form of life left that behind. Again, not because they were sauvage in a kind of Rousseauian sense, but because they were true natural philosophers who had paid attention to that forest because it was from that forest that they found their lives. And this extraordinary knowledge of the botanical wonders of the Amazon 
yielded remarkable drugs for modern science. Here, an old friend of mine of the Cofan people in the Oriente of Ecuador is making poison darts with the preparation known to them as a flying death. Well, this yielded the drug d 2 the muscle relaxant that revolutionized surgery in the 1940s. And whenever we went down to do fundamental ethnopharmacological or ethnobotanical research, we invariably found ourselves in the realm of the shaman. And in fact, my professor used to say, and he was a remarkable man who had sparked the psychedelic era by discovering the magic mushrooms in Mexico in 1938, but he was so conservative he didn't vote for the Republican Party. He professed not to believe in the American Revolution. He always voted for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, he was such an Anglophile that one of his friends said that the only way for him to go native would be to go to England. Uh, but he always said that to remember the adage of the Swiss chemist Paracelsus, who said the difference between a, a poison, a narcotic, a medicine, and a hallucinogen was simply dosage. And this brought us into the realm of the shaman. Now, if you read great scholars like Shirley MacLaine, you would think the shaman's sort of a figure with feathers and bells who sings a lot. Well, I've been with a lot of shaman in my life, and I've never been without with one who wasn't just a little psychotic. That's their job. I mean, they're the ones who swim in the mystic waters the rest of us would drown in. They're the ones who invoke some technique of ecstasy to soar away on the wings of trance to get into those distant metaphysical realms where they can work their deeds of medical, mystical rescue. And the reason we're so fascinated by these societies and their use of plants is because they put the knowledge of a Harvard-trained botanist to shame. One of the curious anomalies of botany is that of the 121 known hallucinogenic plants, 95% are from the Americas. Not because the forests of Africa or Southeast Asia were, were depauperate, but people there found another way to the divine. In the Americas and from Siberia, the route to the Godhead was always through the ingestion of some curious plant, like this one being used by the Yanomami, Ebene the semen of the sun, derived from the blood-red resin of several species in the nutmeg family. These powders are chock full of powerful psychoactive agents, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine. To have this stuff blown up your nose is like being shot out of a rifle barrel lined with Baroque paintings and landing on a sea of electricity. Uh, it creates not the distortion of reality, it creates the disillusion of reality. I used to argue with my professor that you couldn't classify this as hallucinogenic because by the time you're under the influence, there was no one home anymore to experience the hallucinations. But the reason we're interested in these plants is not just their dazzling pharmacological effects, but more importantly, what they tell us about a different way of knowing. Now, the Yanomami blow that stuff up the nose for a specific reason. Those compounds, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, are orally inactive because there's an enzyme found in the human stomach that denatures them. They can only be act taken orally if taken in conjunction with some other compound that denatures that enzyme in the human gut. Well, it turns out the most powerful preparation of the Amazon, ayahuasca, is a combination of plants, the leaves that are full of these tryptamines, and the woody liana, uh, bark of a liana that is... You know what we forgot to do, Jill? I think we've gone back... Oh, oh no, forget, we... It's okay. Uh, this friend of mine does not look like that. <laughs> Uh, unless he's taking too much ayahuasca. Uh, but what's fascinating is the compounds in this bark are MAO inhibitors of the precise sort necessary to potentiate the tryptamines. Now you have to worry about any of that chemistry, but you've got to ask this interesting question. How, in a flora of 80,000 species of plants, did the indigenous people learn to combine these two quite distinct denizens of the forest to create this powerful synergistic effect, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Well, the only scientific explanation is trial and error, which is quickly exposed as a meaningless euphemism. You ask the people, and they say, the plants teach us. Well, what does that mean? Well, my professor was with one society, the Siona Sequoia, in the 1940s, who had 17 different varieties of the same woody liana, all of which to his scientific eye was the same plant and yet they distinguished them consistently at great distances in the forest. And when he asked them the nature of their classification, 
they looked at him like he was a fool, and they said, well, anyone knows you take each one on the night of a full moon, and each one sings to you in a different key. Now, that's not going to get you a PhD at University of Northern British Columbia, but it's a lot more interesting than counting flower parts, and more importantly, it tells you that there are different ways of knowing, and, and these ways of knowing deserve to be respected. Now, this is a very society that I said in the 1970s was on the brink of exhaustion because of the powerful impact of missionaries. They threw out the missionaries, the Colombian government gave back an area of land in perpetuity, encoded in the Constitution, an area of land the size of the United Kingdom with 57 ethnicities, and behind that veil of security, a new dream of culture was born. What we now realize about the Barasana, knowledge that we could have lost so quickly, is that their mythology is an absolute land management plan that dictates how people live in great numbers and can live in great numbers in the Amazon. We now know, and this is knowledge that could have been lost in the early 80s, that these are the descendants of the great civilizations that populated the Amazon, which was not an empty forest. It was home to tens of millions of people. These, these people offer a clue to how you could live in the forest. They had an extraordinary extensive trading networks that facilitated not war but peace, not the least of which was a rule that when you married, you had to marry someone who spoke a different language. And so in any one longhouse, you had six or seven languages spoken, but you never heard a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply watched, wait, waited, listened, and began to speak. Now, if we go from the Amazon into the Andes, I was given a, a fabulous assignment um, by that professor to study a plant known to the Inca as a divine leaf of immortality, coca, the notorious source of cocaine. And it was a remarkable assignment because we knew that in the time of the Inca, the plant had been revered as no other. Unable to cultivate it at the elevation of the imperial capital of Cusco, they replicated it in gold and silver leaf. Incredibly, even though that plant had yielded cocaine hydrochloride, which is our most powerful and important topical anesthetic in modern medicine, nobody knew at the time where it came from, how many species yielded the drug, and most essentially, even though by multilateral agencies had been burning the traditional coca fields for 50 years, long before there was an illicit problem with cocaine. Nobody had ever bothered to do a nutritional study of the plant to see what actually was in it, despite the fact that millions of Aboriginal people, indigenous people of South America, chewed coca every day. We knew that it was revered as no other plant. No act can occur in the Andes without a reciprocal exchange of the power of the leaf with the deities of the mountains. No field can be harvested, no elder led into the realm of the dead. And to the absolute horror of our backers of the US government, we did the first nutritional study of this plant, and we found out that it had a small amount of the alkaloid that was absorbed benignly in the cheek, but it was also chock full of vitamins. It had more calcium than any plant ever studied by science, which made it perfect for a diet that lacked the dairy product. It even had enzymes which enhanced the body's ability to digest carbohydrate at high elevation, which made it perfect for the traditional potato diet in the Andes. So one simple scientific assay put into dramatic profile the horrific efforts that remain underway to this day to eradicate the rights of traditional peoples to use the sacred leaf, and we showed that this was a plant that had been used with no evidence of toxicity, let alone addiction, for over 4,000 years in the Andes. And so with coca as my lens, both literally and metaphorically, I became interested in this notion of sacred geography, and this really brings us to the heart of this conference. When I say sacred geography, again, I don't mean hippie ethnography. I mean, what does it mean to believe that the earth is alive? that the flight of a hawk has meaning, that a river has essential spirit. Well, those notions, through the scientific eye, are ridiculed. And why do we do that? Well, you can actually trace back to a specific intellectual spark in our society, where we wanted to free ourselves from the tyranny of the medieval church. During the Enlightenment, we celebrated the supremacy of mind over spirit, when Descartes famously said that all that mattered was mind and material, with his single gesture, he deanimated the earth. And in doing so, as Saul Bellow said, science made a house cleaning of belief. So the idea that a river could be sacred is ridiculed by modern science. But that misses a point completely. 
Indigenous people are neither sentimental nor weakened by nostalgia. There's not a lot of room for either sentiment in the harsh winds of the Arctic, in the chilling slopes of the Tibetan Plateau. But they have, through time and ritual, created a kind of a, it's not as if they view the world through some kind of lens of ecological purity, which is just a completely simplistic, romantic fantasy. But rather, they've, they've, through time and ritual, created a traditional mystique of the world that's based not on the idea of being self-consciously close to it, but on a far deeper intuition. And that is the idea that the world itself only exists because it's filtered through the human imagination. Now, what do I mean by that? And the important thing about it are the ecological consequences. That doesn't mean that indigenous people around the world don't use their homelands for their well-being but they view those homelands in different ways. Now let me give you an example. I was raised in the coast of British Columbia to believe that those forests existed to be cut. That was the foundation of the ideology of scientific forestry that I was taught in school and that I practiced as an engineer with Macmillan Blodell. That may be very different from my friends amongst the Kaw youth who believe that those same forests were the abode of Hukuk and the crooked beak of heaven and the cannibal spirits that dwelt at the north end of the world that would have to be embraced during the Hamas initiation such that the wisdom of the wild would come back to the community in the potlatch. Now the interesting thing is not to say who's right and who's wrong. Is that forest just cellulose and board feet? Is it the dom domain of the spirit? The interesting thing is how the belief system changes the interaction of the human species to that landscape. My society tore those forests asunder in two generations. The first nations of the coast of British Columbia lived there for thousands of years with a modest ecological footprint. How is it different? For example, this is my godson in a village in Peru. And he was raised to believe that the mountain that dominates his community is an apu, a deity that will direct his destiny. I, by contrast, was raised to believe that the earth was inanimate and dead, and that a mountain was merely a pile of rock ready to be mined. Now, it, his view is more classically the view of human beings around the world. And in these communities, those ideas are celebrated in these wonderful rituals, like one called the Mojimiento, in his community outside of Cusco. Stunningly beautiful valley, site of the summer palace of Topa Inca Yupanqui, the second of the great Inca rulers. Once each year, the fastest boy in every hamlet is given the honor of becoming a woman. And for one day, he becomes a transvestite figure called a Wailaka. And he must dress in the clothing of his sisters or his mothers. And he leads all able-bodied men on a run. But it's not your ordinary run. You start off at 11,500 feet. You run down 2,000 feet to the base of the sacred mountain. Then you run to 16,000 feet. And then you fall away the backside only to cross two more soaring mountain ranges over the course of a 24-hour event. The entire perimeter is marked by holy mounds of earth where the Walaka must spin to bring the vortex of the feminine to the mountain where prayers are given to Pachamama, coca leaves to the wind. And the metaphor is so beautiful. You go into the mountain as an individual, but through sacrifice, and remember the word sacrifice comes from the Latin to make sacred, you emerge as a single community that has reaffirmed your sense of belonging on the planet. And this points out another schism in, in culture. We in the West celebrate the individual at the expense of community. Most societies, like the Dene, like the Cree, the community counts more than the individual because without the individual, without the community, the individual will perish. Now at the age of 48, I became the first outsider and the oldest man ever to run in this race. And I only got through it by chewing more coca leaves in one day than anyone in the 4,000 year history. But what really got through me through it is that I, over the years I had baptized so many children. Not in the, the compadre relationship in the Andes is vital. And it's really an economic relationship. So I had taken on the obligation to educate and look after dozens of kids in this village. So when all my ahados and ahadas found out that their padrino was stupid enough to run the movimiento at 48, uh, they came out from their communities and stuck to me like limpets throughout the day because they weren't about to let anything happen to their cash cow. <laughs> But these localized rituals become truly sublime in these huge pan-Andean rites like the Koyariti, 
where once each year tens of thousands of indigenous people gathered a sacred valley called the Sinicara, and it's a perfect fusion of Catholic and, and pre-Columbian ideas. The symbolism is largely Catholic, the Stations of the Cross, and you carry your cross from your community high onto the ice of the Sinicara, the sacred glaciers. And, and the whole idea is that the crosses are empowered by the ice, but in the shadow of the most sacred mountain of the Inca, Ausangati. The ice, it stays on the ice for 24 hours and then it's carried back home. And then the final act is that you chip pieces of ice from the glacier to bring back to the elders to complete the sacred cycle of the divine. Now, if that's an example of Catholicism fused with pre-Columbian ideas, there's one place in, the, in South America where the pre-Columbian voice is still heard unfettered. And this is an extraordinary complex of people known as the Elder Brother, the Arawakos, the Wiwa, and the Kankwano, and the Kohi, descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization. They, in the wake of the Spanish conquest, they retreated to a high volcanic massif that soars to 20,000 feet, and to this day they're ruled by a ritual priesthood. But the training for the priesthood is incredible. The young acolytes, the young boys, are taken away from their families at the age of two and three, and then held in the men's circle for 18 years. Two nine-year periods deliberately chosen to mimic the nine months they spend in their mother's womb. Now they're in the womb of the great mother, San Anqua. And for that entire time, the world only exists as an abstraction. They never see a sky. They never see a skyline. They never go on walkabout. They are simply there learning the belief systems of their religion, which maintain the idea that their prayers and rituals literally maintain the world. And then at the age of 18 or 19, suddenly the priest who has trained them says, it's time. And they embark on a journey that takes them from the sea to the ice and back to the sea. This was a story so beautiful that anthropologists were not even sure if it could possibly exist. And I, all my career, since I first lived with these people in the early 1970s, I wanted to return and accompany them on one of those pilgrimages. And then a miracle happened. This young man walked into my office at the National Geographic. His name is Danilo Villafania, a very powerful Arawaka leader. He had three priests with him, all barefoot in Washington winter. Priests never wear shoes. They spoke not a word of Spanish, but as I was chatting with Adalberto, I mean with um, Danilo, I said, I hate to say this, mate, but I, you remind me of someone. And I showed him this photograph taken in 1974, and the man on his on, that, on the right is Adalberto, his father, by complete chance. And I said, you may not remember this, but when you were a baby boy, I carried you on my back for months up and down, and his father had been murdered by the paramilitaries. The man on the left, Eugenio, is his cousin, and this man, second from the left, is Eugenio today, a revered elder. Based on this incredible connection, I was invited to go on a journey to the heart of the world. And what we discovered is that the boys aren't kept in the darkness for 18 years, but they never leave the confines of the sacred circle. And indeed, when time comes, having learned everything there is to learn about the glory of the idea that you hold in your hands the fate of the world, they do go on pilgrimage. Every single ripple in the landscape resonates with mythological significance. Even the hats they wear are attempt to mimic the ice fields found at the heart of the world. We got to the penultimate stage of the, of the um, pilgrimage when suddenly we discovered the FARC were about to kidnap us, and so we had a rather dramatic escape. You don't really have a dramatic escape on a mule. You kind of clip-clop your way to rescue. But what was fabulous, of course, I want to stress all of these journeys are collaborations. We were making a film here with the Arawakos, and so we had trained Arawako and Wiwa cinematographers. So we simply handed over our high-definition cameras, and uh, they finished the film for us. As we went back down to the coast with the elders, where even today, though, the sacred sites are covered with skyscrapers and whorehouses and discotheques, that does not stop them from pursuing their ritual obligation their prayers upon which the world depends. Their metaphor in life is a loom. They say, upon this loom I weave my life. When they pray, they turn their fingers to spin wool. As they move across the landscape, they describe their journeys as threads, so that over the course of a lifetime, you weave a cloth over the flank of Mother Earth. They speak in full paragraphs about the need for the younger brother, that's the rest of us, who they say is destroying the world to change the way we perceive it. 
They say that you must act like the elder brother and recognize that you have in your power the duty and the obligation to protect the earth. An extraordinary society, and it's humbling to think that they live but two hours by plane from Miami Beach. So even as we sit here today, the mamos of the Kogi and the Arawakos are in the darkness praying for your well-being. Now, the way I began to open my own mind to the power of culture came through encounters. And in the early 1980s, I suddenly was summoned to my professor's office and asked, having lived four or five years in South America, whether I was interested in going down to the island nation of Haiti, infiltrating the secret societies of voodoo, and securing the formula of a folk poison used to make zombies. Well, naturally, I said yes. Uh, thinking that it might consume my life for a fortnight, it consumed my life for four years. Because it was only the embrace of the African reality that allowed me to really have a window to the mystic open wide before me. You know, it's interesting, again, this is something First Nations from this continent will understand. You know, you, you hear voodoo described as black magic. Why? Voodoo is a word from fon, the Fon language of Dahomey that means spirit or God. Were I to ask you the name of the great religions of the world, what continents left out? Sub-Saharan Africa. The tacit assumption being that black people had no religion. Well, of course they did. And voodoo is not a black magic cult. It's a distillation of very profound community-based religious ideas that came over during the tragic diaspora of the slavery era. It became sown in the fertile soil of the new world. The essence of voodoo is a dynamic relationship between living and the dead in the spirit realms so that in the moment of, of divine epiphany, the spirit displaces the soul of the living so that the human being actually becomes the God. That's why Haitians used to always say to me, you white people go to church and speak about God, we dance in the temple and become God. And that's why you see these dramatic displays slicing into the skin to show the power of faith. Or more powerfully, uh, acolytes handling burning embers with impunity, an astonishing uh, example of the mind's ability to affect the body that bears it when catalyzed in religious trance. So in the end, you know, we have this idea that these cultures, quaint and colorful they, though they may be, are somehow destined to fade away as if they're failed attempts at being modern, failed attempts at being white or whatever it is. Nothing could be further from the truth. As I said earlier, technology is no threat to culture. The internet has emerged as a kind of global campfire that's empowered indigenous people all around the world. Similarly, change is no threat to culture. What is a threat to culture is power. These are not delicate societies who've missed the train to the future. In every key case, these are dynamic living peoples being driven out of existence by identifiable forces. I wrote a book about Haitian voodoo that was made into the worst Hollywood movie in history. And Hemingway said that if you sell a book to Hollywood, you should start off in Arizona, drive to the California state line, throw your book over and go back to Tucson and have a drink. Uh, I didn't do that. I disappeared in the forests of Borneo. I always wanted to live with nomads of the rainforest. I always wanted to live in a place wet with the innocence of birth. Nomadic peoples, as I don't need to tell the Dene, are very different. How do you measure wealth in a society where there's no incentive to accumulate possessions? In the society of the Penan, wealth is explicitly defined as a strength of social relations between human beings. Because if those fray, everybody suffers. There's no word for thank you in the Penan language because sharing is automatic. The biggest sanction or the biggest bad behavior is a failure to share. I remember um, giving a cigarette to a Penan woman and watching as she tore it apart to distribute equitably the individual strands of tobacco to the huts of the encampment, rendering the product useless, honoring her obligation to share. Unfortunately, by the time, the other thing that I've always noticed, whether in the Arctic, Greenland, or the Kalahari, is that societies that come from an oral tradition, we forget that writing was a great advance, but writing by definition is a tool to numb memory. And in oral traditions, it's the mind that stays alive. And the entire knowledge of the society rests in the vocabulary and memories of the best storyteller. And I've always noticed in these societies that in the same way that we can hear the voices of a character when we read a novel, they can hear the voices of animals in nature, such that the flight of a hornbill becomes a cursive script of nature, like a vocabulary written on the wind. But unfortunately, by the time I got there in 1988, the sounds of the forest were the sound of machinery. 
Throughout the 1980s, the homeland of the Penang suffered the highest rate of deforestation on earth. In a single generation, women were reduced to prostitution and servitude. Their rivers were so laden with silt that it seemed as if half of Borneo was slipping away to the South China Sea where the Japanese freighters hung light on the horizon ready to fill their holes with raw logs ripped from the heart of the forest. Children suffered from diseases in forced settlement camps. Men completely overwhelmed, humiliated, uh, rebellious, uprising, a quixotic gesture, blowpipes against bulldozers and machine guns, but no match for the power of the Malaysian state. And so, not too long ago, the last of the Penan in the forest settled. And so within a single generation, a way of life morally inspired, inherently right, has been crushed along with a forest that gave it birth. Now these egregious industrial initiatives are not limited to distant spheres. This is my closest friend amongst the Taltan, Oscar Dennis. This is a photograph that appeared in the National Geographic magazine. It did have an interesting effect on women around the world. Uh, suddenly women from Poland and Moscow were suddenly beating their doors down to Iskit. And Oz would call me up and, like we're brothers, we've known each other 30 years, he said, wait, there's this woman from Moscow coming to see me. I say, man, you just had someone from Poland last week, you know. Yeah, I know. You can't speak Polish, right? I don't think they really come for conversation. <laughs> but of course, Oscar is one of the great advocates for the protection of the sacred headwaters, whereby this remarkable miracle of geography, the headwaters of the Skeena, the Nass, and the Stikine, are born in remarkably close proximity to them. And so in a long day, you can follow the tracks of grizzly and wolf and drink from the very sources of the rivers that gave birth to the and cradled the great civilizations of the Northwest Coast, because each one of those rivers was associated with a great culture. The Stikine, of course, the Taltan, and the Klinket at the mouth, the Nishka on the Nass, and of course on the Skeena, the Gitsan Wutsuotun, the Kerry, the Heisla, and even the Haida, because the salmon from the Skeena feed the children of Haida Gwai. I showed this photograph to Premier Campbell when I met with him, and what I found to my astonishment is that the Premier not only in his two terms of office, but in his entire life, had never visited a quarter of the province, even as his government was authorizing industrial licenses and permits. And I said two things to the Premier. I said, let me tell you about my friend Oscar, and I had permission from the family to say this. In the last five years before this photograph was taken, Oscar's brother hung himself in the basement of Mary's house. His other brother died uh, because he drowned 10 feet from shore. He never learned how to swim. His third brother died of medical malpractice, accused of being a drunk Indian in Prince Rupert. Oscar's sister got an ICBC settlement and died on the streets of Prince George. And Oscar's only daughter blew her head off playing Russian roulette with a handgun. And I said, in those five years, Barrett Gold has taken out of Taltan country 400 tons of gold and 5,000 tons of silver, a market value today of $25 billion, and I want to know why there's not a swimming pool in Iskit. Why isn't there a hockey rink in Iskit? Why isn't there trust funds for every kid to go to college? Why isn't there a trust fund for people to get low interest loans? Why isn't there an elder center? Why has not the infrastructure of this community of about 350 people not changed one iota while this company has taken out from their land. land it's, not a, it's not a poetic idea that this is Taltan land. Every definition of British law and jurisprudence says that Taltan never were conquered, they never were, gave up their land, and they've never been treated with, and this is Taltan land. And they didn't get a penny, virtually, of that entire thing, with the exception of some monies that went for road building contracts. So there are two issues on these resource issues. Should the mines go in, and if so, at what pace, in what places, at what cost to the environment, and for whose benefit? And critically, that's the question. If a mine is going to go into a First Nations land, jobs aren't enough. You know, it, 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 and think for a second of how these mines get established. This is the actual meadow of the sacred headwaters source of all the salmon rivers of home. What does it take to get a mine account? A bunch of white guys get together on a golf course and cobble together a company with less history than my dog. They get online and they secure the subsurface rights to a place they've never been, the stories they've never heard, the pain of a long winter they've never experienced, and as long as they can guarantee the government a, row, a, a, a flow of revenues, either in the form of taxation or royalties, they secure by definition the right to transform that place for all time. But what's fascinating, and this is a culturally bound idea. There's not a single metric in the calculus that rationalizes the industrialization of the wild that places any value on the land left alone 
or any cost to the rest of us implicit in its destruction. Now we take that for a given because it's how we industrialize the wild, but it's rather unusual. I mean, it's a little bit I was saying last night to uh, Jasmine, it's like if she's got a garden growing roses here in Fort Nelson and I come along and I say, guess what, I want, I want to buy your roses. And I'm such a good corporate citizen, I'm going to even give your kids jobs plucking those roses. And so we have this transaction, I walk away with all the roses, she's got some money in her pocket, and then as I look over my shoulder, I say, oh, by the way, I'm destroying your house. And you say, well, what are you going to do to compensate me for the house? I said, I'm not going to do anything to compensate you for the house. This is a transaction about roses. I, I employed your kids. What more do you want? Well, in a way, that's how the industrialization of these areas occur. And it's not the norm. That's how I want to stress. You know, I, I remember I, in the, um, in, in, I was in the lodge of a friend of mine who had died on his trap line. <laughs> And I saw this white guy in the corner, and this woman walked in, and I knew from the way she was walking that she was an engineer from the Imperial Metals Red Chris Mine, where they want to literally put an open pit copper and gold mine on a mountain that's home to the largest population of stone sheep in the planet. Uh, a place you can't even shoot a sheep with a rifle, but you're, they're allowed to destroy it with a mine. And I could tell this woman worked for the mine. It used to be you could tell a miner because they wore steel-toed boots and hard hats and now they look like they come out of a Patagonia clothing catalog, but you can still tell. And they had a breathless conversation, and this is how the conversation went. Wow, did you see? Well, I, have you ever seen so many sheep? I've never seen sheep before. These, I counted 10 grizzly bear. What about the wolves? Ever been up here before? No, I never got beyond Williams Lake. What? I got to Prince George once for a conference. So, Wow, it's so beautiful here. But they couldn't get the irony that they were here in a place they had never been before with a corporate and, and, and bureaucratic dis mission to destroy it. And I kept thinking, maybe they'll just get the irony of it and leave it all behind, but they won't. And this valley will be completely inundated with toxic tailings. And this is why my friend James Dennis, Oscar's father, says, you know, there should always be a, a deal. Before any mining company can come into traditional territory, they have to bring all their children to meet all of our children. The parents will get out of the way and leave the children to cut a deal. And the deal will be this, very simple. For every tree cut on tall tan territory, a rose bush goes down in the garden of the CEO's wife's garden in West Vancouver. For every drop of toxic waste that goes into a river or a lake of tall tan territory, a similar drop of toxic waste will go to the local rec center where their children swim in West Vancouver. Maybe if we had that kind of arrangement, people would think a little bit more carefully about the impact that these developments have. Not to eliminate the developments, but to recognize that there are places to put mines and places not to put mines, and to put a mine on Tottigan Mountain is like drilling for oil in the Sistine Chapel. Now, this, of course, is not how the Taltan people view it, and that's why they gathered as early as 2006 at the Sacred Headwaters, supported by a dozen First Nations, including the Cascadeni, to say this land is a land of our origins. This is a neighborhood. This is a church, a sanctuary, the burial grounds of our ancestors, and the people who own this land are the generations as yet to be born. And that's why they're resistance. Now, I want to stress that the way we view land is not normal. And I want to take you to the opposite end of the human spectrum, to the Aboriginal people of Australia, because you'll see a very different way of thinking. We know from studies of the Y chromosome that they were the first people to walk out of Africa. Within 5,000 miles, they crossed the underbelly of Asia. Then they crossed the waters from New Guinea, hit the most parsimonious continent on Earth, and they went walking. And over thousands of years, they established 10,000 clan territories, all connected by a single idea, and that is a dreaming. And the dreaming's not a dream. It's the idea that the world at your feet both exists and is always waiting to be born. In not one of the 670 dialects and languages of Australia was there a word for past, present, or future, nor was there a word for time. There was only the dreaming. And the clan territories were linked together by the song lines, which were the trajectories walked at the dawn of time by the rainbow serpent or the ancestors as they sang the world into being. Now, when the British arrived in Australia, they saw people who looked weird, who had a primitive technology, and what really offended the British is that the Aboriginal people had no interest whatsoever in improving upon their lot. Now, for the British, that was deeply offensive because self-improvement, progress, was the ethos of their age. So in an inimitable way, they concluded that the Aboriginal people of Australia were not human beings. And as recently as 1902, it was debated in Parliament in Australia as to whether Aboriginal people were human beings or not. In the 1960s, 
A textbook in Australian schools, a treasury of fauna of Australia, included the Aboriginal people as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife of the continent. But what was in fact going on was a subtle devotional philosophy beyond the reach of the British imagination, and that was the dreaming. In this entire civilization, the entire purpose of life was the opposite of progress. It was stasis, constancy. The entire purpose of life was to do nothing to change the world, and rather to do the ritual gestures that were deemed to be necessary to keep the world exactly as it was at the time of its creation. Now the fascinating thing, again, is not to say who's right and who's wrong, but had humanity as a whole followed this devotional track, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon, but we also wouldn't be talking about global climate change and our capacity to change the vital life support systems of the planet. Now very often, the culprit afflicting culture is ideological. This is a photograph of a Buddhist nun I took in Cambodia, and you can see that her feet and hands have been sliced from her body during the era of Pol Pot in the killing fields for the crime of pursuing her Buddhist faith. And if we go into the mountains of Tibet, where I spend a lot of time, you'll see the consequences of when the Marxist materialists of Beijing uh, inspired by this man, Karl Marx, who distilled his theories in the reading room of the British Library and imposed that set of Western values all around the world in a way that would have been laughable had it not resulted in so much agony for our, uh, our, our, our friends in all cultures of the world. When Mao Zedong famously whispered to the Dalai Lama that all religion was poison, the Dalai Lama knew what was coming. When the, ja the Chinese finally took over Tibet for good in 1959, 6,000 religious structures were torn apart, blasted by artillery, bombed from the air. 1.2 million Tibetans were killed for their religious faith. Now what was it about the Buddhist Dharma that so offended the Tibetans? All it the Buddhist Dharma is distilled in the Four Noble Truths. All life is suffering. By that, the Buddha just meant that shit happens. The second of the Noble Truths is the source of suffering is ignorance. By that, he didn't mean stupidity. He meant the tendency of human beings to cling to the, their own centrality in the stream of divine existence. The third of the Noble Truths was the revelation that ignorance could be overcome. And the fourth and most important was the delineation of a contemplative practice that if followed not only had the possibility of a transformation of the human heart, but had 2,500 years of evidence that such a transformation would indeed occur. And so to make this film, The Buddhist Science of the Mind, I traveled with this remarkable man, Mathieu Ricard. French by birth, his father was France's most illustrious philosopher who wrote a two-volume history of Western philosophy from memory. His mother was a famous painter, if you can believe it. He learned photography from Cartier-Bresson. Stravinsky taught him to play piano. He learned anthropology at the feet of Claude Lévi-Strauss. He was studying molecular biology in a lab of a Nobel laureate at the Pasteur Institute when he suddenly realized that there was no correlation between fame, wealth, and happiness. And so he dropped out and went back to the one place he was always happy, and he became ordained as a Tibetan monk. With me on this journey was also Shara Barma, traditional doctor, Tibetan doctor, looking rather quizzically at my urine in a diagnosis that simply said, you're very tired, you're very tired. <laughs> and we were blessed by Trosa Rinpoche, the head of the Nyingma tradition, and our goal on this mission was not to, to, we wanted to explore the nature of what a hero is, but not the Western heroes who climb the flanks of Everest, deliberately entering a zone of death, uh, a zone of oxygen deprivation where consciousness is obliterated, which is for the Tibetan about the stupidest thing you could do in the world. We wanted to go to be in the presence of a true Buddhist hero, a bodhisattva, a woman who had achieved liberation from the realm of samsara, but had remained in this place to facilitate the liberation of all sentient beings. This was a woman who had never wanted to marry. As a young, beautiful girl, she had been forced to be betrothed to a merchant. When he came to claim her in the Solukumbu Valley, she escaped by crawling down a latrine. Covered by human excrement, she turned up at the Temboche Monastery. The Lama cleaned her up, sent her across the Nangpala Pass, 23,000 feet into Tibet. And then she came back, ordained as a nun, and 45 years ago, she went into lifelong retreat and lived for 45 years in a room the size of this corner of the stage, never seeing the light of the sun on her face. Because Sherab had been treating her medically, we had the opportunity to go and see her. So we began on this journey to the heart of the Himalaya, 
along the tracks that both these men had followed in their religious devotions, to the cave where Sherab, as part of his seven years of medical training, had lived for a year in solitary retreat, a cave to which he returns every year, as Mathieu chanted the sutras, and finally we came to this monastery. And this next photograph was taken as a door opened on this woman's face for the first time in 45 years. By the terms of reference of Western culture, she should have been a madwoman. Instead, the face radiated loving compassion. She instantly began to take Mathieu to task for the unnecessarily Baroque rituals that the male-dominated monasteries pursue, and she said everything is distilled in the mantra. And for 45 years, all she had done is recited day and night a single prayer. And what she achieved was transformation. And later that night, when I was still in sort of stunned wonder, I ran into a lama, and he said to me an interesting thing. He said, you know, we in Tibet don't believe that you went to the moon, but you did. You may not believe that we achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, but we do. So in the end, then, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of world do we want to live in? A monochromatic world of monotony, or do we want to celebrate a polychromatic world of diversity? The great anthropologist Margaret Mead said her greatest fear before she died was that as we drifted toward this blandly amorphous generic culture, uh, not only would the entire range of the human imagination be reduced to a single way of thinking, but we would wake one day as from a dream, having forgotten that there are other possibilities of life. The other cultures of the world are not failed attempts at being us. They're not failed attempts at being modern. Each is a unique answer to the fundamental challenge. What does it mean to be alive? Each has something to say. And the issue isn't to freeze people in time. The issue is to find a way that all peoples can engage in the genius of modernity without that engagement demanding the death of their ethnicity. The issue isn't the traditional or the modern, but it's the rights of free people to choose their path forward. And the reason this is so important is because culture is not trivial. Culture is not decorative. It's not the vests you're wearing. It's not the drum beats we heard. Culture is something deeper than that. Culture is a body of ethical and moral values that every culture places around each individual human being to keep at bay the barbaric heart that history teaches us lies just beneath the surface of every human being. It's culture that allows us to make sense out of sensation, to find order and meaning in a universe that may have none. It's culture that allows us, as Lincoln said, to always seek the better angels of our nature. And if you want to know what happens when culture is lost, when the individual, either through coercion or his own volition, chooses to turn his back on the constraints of culture, perhaps even with the dream of achieving a level of affluence that he sees to be celebrated in the West, but invariably ends up on the lowest rung of an economic ladder that goes nowhere. Uh, seduced by a notion of globalization, which is nothing more or less than the pursuit of cheap labor by capital, when he sees the quality of his life suffer and he indulges in a place of alienation and disaffection, to see what happens, all you have to go, all you have to do is go to the points of complete cultural chaos and breakdown around the world, be it Somalia, the, the Maoists in the gates of Kathmandu or indeed the butt-naked brigades of Liberia. Culture is not trivial, and mercifully, we are beginning to recognize this. You know, in our own country of Canada, the Inuit people were not treated well. When the British first arrived, they took the Inuit to be savages. The Inuit took the British to be gods. Both were wrong. One did more to honor the human race. And what the British failed to recognize is that there was no better measure of genius than the ability of the Inuit people to survive in an environment where everything had to be forged from the coal. The Inuit didn't fear the cold, they took advantage of it. And when Europeans mimicked their ways, they achieved great feats of exploration. Mostly they persisted in importing their own environment with them, such that the dead of Franklin's expedition found at Starvation Cove in the Adelaide Peninsula, the, soldier, the sailors were dragging behind them a sled made of oak and iron in Manchester, England that weighed 500 pounds. On top of it was a dory from his ship that weighed 300 pounds. Inside were all the accoutrements of a British naval officer's dinner service, including silver plate and a copy of the novel The Vicar of Wakefield. They were somehow expected to drag this a thousand kilometers through the barren lands of the north, hoping that they might bump into a Hudson Bay post and achieve salvation. Of course, they suffered a terrible death. But the Inuit, by contrast, moved lightly on the land. F cold was not to be feared, but to be taken advantage of. The runners of their sleds were originally made of Arctic char, three fish laid in a row and wrapped in caribou skin. 
the Inuit had a sense of the cold that's remarkable. In fact, the ebbing and flowing of ice creates the entire ethos of the civilization. This is a photograph I took 250 kilometers out on the ice at Iglulik, polar bear hunting. That night, the temperature dropped to minus 65 Celsius, and we simply entered a igloo that they constructed, slipped into the skins, got the oil lamps going, and made our dinner. And, and like what Greenpeace will tell you, blood on ice in the Arctic is not a sign of death, but an affirmation of life itself. And when the, the, the incredible thing is we're finally realizing in Canada that the presence of diversity and in indigenous people within our society, our greatest society, does not embarrass the nation state, it contributes to it if the state's prepared to accept diversity. And I have to leave with one sort of story uh, this afternoon uh, that I thought was apophical, but when I was, polar, when I was narwhal hunting at the tip of Baffin Island with these friends of mine from Arctic um, Bay, uh, this man, Olayak, told me a story from the 1950s, a dark period of Canadian history when we forcibly moved the Inuit in settlements to establish our sovereignty in an archipelago that could have gone back to the Europeans or to the Americans. Um, this, this man's grandfather categorically refused to enter the settlements, and so fearful for his life, the family took away all of his implements, his weapons, his tools. And did this force him into the settlement? No. In the middle of an Arctic night with a blizzard blowing, the old man slipped outside of the igloo, pulled down his caribou hide and sealskin trousers, and defecated into his hand. As the feces began to freeze, he shaped into the form of an implement, and when forged from the cold, the human waste had become a tool. He put a spray of saliva along the leading edge, and with what he called a shit knife, he killed a dog. He skinned the dog with it, improvised the traces of a sled with the skin of the dead dog, improvised a sled with the rib cage of the dead dog, and then shit knife and belt, harnessing up an adjacent living dog, disappeared into the Arctic night. Now get, talk about getting by with nothing. Uh, now I thought they were pulling my leg. It sounds like a perfect thing to tell an anthropologist. Uh, but then I read the great thing in the journals of Peter Freuken, who was with Newt Rasmussen on the Fifth Thule expedition, where they took dogs all the way across the top of Canada to Point Barrow. There's a marvelous moment when uh, Freuken's trapped in the barren lands in a blizzard. He makes a trough in the snow and, and, and pulls his sled on top of himself, inadvertently making a coffin of his own making as it all freezes. He's totally stuck in there. And in his journal, he says, completely in passing, I thought of making a shit knife, but I really couldn't maneuver. So I, and I thought, now I'm not saying there's an assembly line making shit knives in the Arctic. But it's a one, even if it's not true, it's too good not to tell. And, and it, it also is a great symbol of the cultural resilience of all circumpolar peoples. But of course, finally and sadly, after enduring so much in a single generation, the culture of poverty inherent in the welfare system, drugs, the, the presence of missionaries, the, sedin the sedentary life imposed on people, Operation Surname, you go on and on and on. And even as the cultures throughout the circumpolar area are resurgent, now they're dealing with something beyond their capacity to control, and that's climate change. This, is a this last photograph was taken at Kanak, the northernmost community in the world. The polar Eskimo, and Eskimo is not a pejorative term there, this exemplifies what I'm talking about. If you land at their community, you see beautiful little Danish huts. Everybody's got a DVD. Everybody's got a cell phone. Great clinic, great co-op store, but you don't see a skidoos because they made a decision that dogs were the cultural pivot, that not only did dogs allow you to stay relatively free of the cash economy, they also allowed you to teach your children. And the transmission of knowledge about working dogs from father to son, mother to daughter, was the glue that held the culture together. So Connick has maybe a thousand people and 40,000 dogs. And going out on the ice with them, the tragedy is that the ice used to arrive in the month of September and stay till July. Now it comes in November and it's gone by March. So in a single generation, their way of life is literally melting from beneath them. And finally, one point I'd like to make about climate change. We see it as a controversy, we see it as a technical or scientific challenge for all of these indigenous people around the world who take personal responsibility for the well-being of the earth. It's a deeply psychological problem because if, if climate change is happening, it's their fault. The Koyariti ritual I told you about where they bring the chunks of blocks of ice back to their communities for the elders, they've unilaterally stopped doing that. 
because they believe that they're responsible for the recession of the glaciers. In the Northwest Amazon, in the Sierra Nevada, the ritual activities have reached an almost frenetic pace, as indeed in the deserts of Australia, as people all around the world frantically try to play some part in the healing of this desperate situation. And it's poignant to think that people who played no role in the creation of that problem are doing more to try to address it um, in the terms of reference of their own civilizations as we who created the problem in the first place. So I'd just like to close by saying I hope this has given you a sense that we need the multiple voices of humanity because the prayers of these young Tibetan monks or the hopes of this young Maasai warrior on the Serengeti Plain are all part of our own collective geography of hope. Thank you very much.